And on a Sunday, my ticket is a one way. I'm about to play in the sky. I always knew you'd make it one day. Today was such a fun day. Ladies and gentlemen, Deb Antich and her four alchemy crystal bowls. Wow, that was awesome. So, my guest today is a mental health and behavioral health, has a mental health and behavioral health nonprofit called Hologram, um, helping others live on. She's instrumental in the local substance abuse recovery community. On top of that, she's a juvenile case manager, or CASA, a court appointed special advocate. Um, she'll stand in court for children that have been removed from their homes by CPS, which means she's an angel. Um, she's a CFP, a certified family partner who has been living with a child that has a mental health disorder. And she's a healer whose tools are the supernatural. Her name is Deb Antich, and we're so excited to have you on the show. Welcome to Wazi Circus. Thank you for having me. So, that was amazing. It's not me. <laughs> it's <laughs> all I can't take any credit. I just told the wands. All right. And hey, what are the what are the wands? What what were you playing? Explain that whole. So these are alchemy crystal bowls, which means they are ninety nine point nine percent crystal, and they have different components in them that give them different alchemies. And I was drawn to one bowl. Thought I would get that one bowl. I actually went to go get a set of bowls and found out how ridiculously expensive they are. And I was like, okay, I'm going to go back and get this one. And the woman that I was purchasing it from had set up a sound bath, which is a healing with bowls that she chooses specific for the person or the set of people. And I ended up getting four of them. <laughs> 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 and I didn't, um, it is... One of the things that I study and work with is generational poverty, mm -hmm. and I have some real issues with generational poverty, and my sister actually went with me for the sound healing, and because she said, that's how we are about not being able to purchase as many as I wanted, I was like, no, I'm going to break this right now, <laughs> and so I ended up with four, of, and I'm planning on getting more. They're addictive, so yeah. 
Nice. So, um, alchemy. What 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 does that mean when it pertains to the crystal bowls? So, like, okay, one of them is um, for. So, my bowls are. Let me see if I can remember. Um, so, this little gray one has to do with the sacral and having to do with the chakras, okay. and then um, this one is the heart. This one is the throat, and this one is the crown. Okay. And each tone is tuned specifically for that chakra. And I'm just learning about them myself. I heard, so I spoke at South by Southwest. I presented. Okay. I kind of got pulled in by an old kind of colleague of mine. And I heard a woman that was with our organization play the bowls. And I was just like, oh, my God, I need to have these. Like, these are supposed to be part of my next step okay and i ended up going up to dallas which is where the woman was that she got the bowls from and i heard them and i just knew that they were going to come home with me <laughs> immediately yeah no question like and they don't it, it's cr this sounds crazy i know it does but i hear and say crazy things all the time they pick the player okay so they picked me I understand. And it's the actual vibration of the sound that that is the 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 delivery of the healing. Is that right? Yeah. So um, within the body, there's different places where um, past traumas can be held. This mm -hmm. is at, at least this is for me and how I play them with the intention um, is to heal past trauma. And mm -hmm. so um, I can't explain it. It finds it and vibrationally frequency I don't even know how it makes adjustments and I played them the other night and I recorded it and I listened to the recording twice on the way home because it was like six minutes long and I felt like I'd had a deep tissue massage I wow. slept so I've got some pretty severe issues with sleep last night it was 4 30 in the morning and I was couldn't sleep I hadn't slept and I put on one of those six minute recordings and I woke up like I, I, it put me to sleep and awesome. that's to me, that's healing. So oh, that is awesome. And what are the wands made of? Um, so the wands, I am not an expert on the wands, so okay. I'm not good. You can't hold me to it, but I believe that they are um, wrapped with suede okay. and it's probably just a resin inside. It feels like, okay. But yeah, these are, um, and I, when I bought them, I kept wanting to call them mallets mm -hmm. and she was like, Oh no, they're wands. And I was wanting to hold it more like that. One of the things with the bowls is um, I'm learning patience. And okay. I know that that's my next step mm -hmm. is patience and temperance. All of us. Yes. And um, so, and control, being able to give up control to the bowls. So you have to hold it more like this and just gently instead of like this. Do you know what I mean? Right, like right, that right. was my, so I kept referring Approach to it as a mallet. A mallet, which is mm. not the right word right. because you could shatter this. That you don't want to strike the bowl. Yes, very gently. And so you had never seen them before. I So I had seen them um, played in a tiny chapel okay. and um, a different type, though. They were um, a different type of bowl, not alchemy. Alchemy is like a very specific type. And um, the energy that was created, like it felt like wind. In fact, I've played them before. Um, a lot of times I'll just play them and put my iPhone and just set it so that it's just filming the ceiling. And I was playing them and the ceiling fan was turning. I had turned it off. The fan was turning. And then when I stopped, the fan stopped. Wow. So like, this is no joke. Like the vibration that they put off, especially in a large space is moving. Right. Moving. And so for a healing, would it be a circle? Would you be in the center and people would sit around and listen? Or how does how um, would you facilitate? It's real. God, it just, every space is different. Uh -huh, Do you okay. know what I mean? Yeah. Like every space is different. The people that are there. Um, I wanted to use the word dictate, but that's not the right word to use here. Um, is like I would sit here with like a little semicircle. And usually people will have like a yoga mat or a blanket mm -hmm. and then have a blanket over them and ideally have their eyes closed and um, like a little eye mask mm -hmm. so that they're, it's just like being enveloped in sound. Right. 
Right. So you said you do a lot of work with generational poverty. Yes. Will yes. You, will we explain that term. So um, generational poverty and generational trauma, it's genetic. It's passed down from, um, there's, I'm not a big biblical person, but there's a biblical saying about the the sins of the father mm-hmm. going down to the seven, the seven sons. Seventh generation, right. Right. And it's, um, that's what I've seen is that okay. um, trauma and poverty, which is a trauma, yes. um, can be passed down from generation to generation. And genetically, not, not just behaviorally learned, but it, you know, it's really interesting because people want to say it's nature or nurture. It's mm-hmm. both. Right. And so the environment also has plays a role, but the environment is created from the generation before right. because we all grow up, you know, most people grow up with their parents and their siblings. And I can, it's interesting to see the impact that one sibling stepping out can make on the rest. And um, even whenever they don't even realize that they're being watched. Okay. Yeah. So, um, like stepping out on their own to like do something better with themselves or stepping out as in? To, yeah, to be able to um, follow the path that is theirs right. and not the one that it, like one of the big things I hear right. a lot of my work is, I'm doing what my father wanted me to do. Mm. I, I'm doing what my parents wanted me to do. And so when people are doing that, they're not being true to themselves. And right. so be to true be, to thine self, yeah. to be able to say, okay, I hear what your plan is for me, but there's a bigger role that I'm meant to fill. And right. for a lot of people that I work with, um, it's roles that are quiet, um, jobs that are, uh, so I work with, um, people in recovery and have had issues with substance use. And I find like, I come across so many welders, very specific okay. type of work, right. very, you know, singular work. And then I come across people that are part of a big community, but like you have to, uh, what you just said, like to thy own, thine own self be true. Right. Like if you're not doing what you're supposed to do, right. that's where things like disease come in, like chronic illness. Right. Um, I, there is a really fascinating From study. From just not living your life the way it should be led. Yeah. Right. Okay. Yeah. You were saying a study. No, there's um, a study called the ACEs study and you can pull it up online. Um, it was done through Kaiser Permanente that uh, there was a doctor that was, he worked with people that were obese, like, but very obese. Mm-hmm. And he was finding that a lot of his patients would get, drop everything down to 20 pounds. And then they would start to put weight on again. And he was like, this is, why is this happening? Um, and he created this questionnaire. It's 10 questions. It's called the ACEs quiz. ACEs stands for Adverse Childhood Experiences. Mm and how they affect us later on in life. So um, if you find it online, it's the ACEs questionnaire. If you have four or more ACEs, your chances of having a chronic disease later in life, which can include things like substance use, obesity, uh, COPD, increase by 55%. Um, From this ACEs, just four. Mm -hmm. If you answer correctly, oh wow. Yeah. And it's the childhood. It's in, uh, see, in my work, I do feel like it's also generational. Right, right. You're and saying that. this is new. I mean, this is really recent. And so um, there's more research being done around it. Right. But that um, so many different things can have an impact on who we are. Right. Especially our own. I don't want to say choice because sometimes that's not, not a, a choice. Not a right. choice. But um that, that if you're not doing what you know you're meant to be doing, you're mm-hmm. you're setting yourself up for dis-ease in the body. Dis-ease in the body, exactly. There's a book called, this guy named Stephen Pressfield, it's called The War of Art. Okay. Not The Art of War, The War of Art. And he labels that exact force called resistance. Yes. Um, you know, procrastination, not living to your full potential yeah. is the leading cause of depression, disease, alcoholism, yes. destruction of oneself because you're not living up to your own potential. Yeah. And his whole book is saying that, you know, there's an angel, a force in the universe screaming for you to live your gifts and goals. And if you don't offer them up, you're actually robbing us of the experience of mm-hmm. learning from you. So, you know, it is that intense to live your live yeah. your dreams and be true to yourself. I mean, I have to do it. You know, we have to do it or you won't get anywhere. Yes. Um, would you say that 
a lot. Okay, so it's 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 both. You're saying it's genetic, but would you say childhood trauma may be the leading cause for the mental health disorders and maybe substance abuse in our communities, or it's bigger than that? I. So my initial response is that it's bigger than that. It can be boiled down to a handful of things. Mm-hmm. So some of like my personal research that I'm doing is um, around brain health okay. and. Because mental health to me is so overly, like too overly used, but brain health is more specific. And it feels like there is a stigma around mental health that isn't really present when you talk about the brain. So, I'm sorry, I just, this happens sometimes. It's all good. And you'll see it happen. I, um, like the students that I work with, I'll tell them, I'll be like, okay, you're going to see, I'll be talking and I'll just stop. Right. And it's like somebody picked the needle up off the record. So you'll see that it's happens okay. with me sometimes. But um, And that's some of my own mental health stuff. Okay, yeah. So I was going to say, you yourself have been diagnosed with autism, ADHD, and have a dyscalculia. <laughs> a yes. Dyscalculia, we looked that up. And a penchant for mania. Yes. So you sound like most of my friends. <laughs> I probably am. <laughs> your friends. Yes, hi. I'm Deborah. Right. <laughs> so um, you were saying um, brain health over mental health and like how, you know, we... Um, maybe are you saying nutrition wise or spiritual wise on the brain health both okay so um, one of the okay thank you for bringing me back okay. um, a big thing is not we do too much as animals like okay. I you know we're animals look mm-hmm. at what other animals do compared to what we do right and really we're doing in fact um, I just left one of those positions that you literally earlier this week because I'm doing too much Mm -hmm. and I'm not, I realized that I'm not dedicating the time to my family to, Mm -hmm. and this, now with this work has moved in. Do you know what I'm saying? So it's like something comes in, something has to go out. And so often I feel like we've been trained maybe in the last 20, 30 years that Oh, no, you just do, 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 do. Right. But that's not what we're supposed to be doing. No. We should have balance. Yeah. <clears throat> and I, I had to struggle to find that in my own life. Um, I skydive professionally. I work in the um, indoor skydiving world. Uh, I'm writing a book. Uh, I've got a family that is full-time, <laughs> 100% all on board. And finding that balance took me years, and it's always a struggle on one side or the other. Uh, I was told once by a good friend that you juggle three balls. It's your health, uh, your finances, and your family. Yeah. And you can only keep two balls up at a time. But, yeah. but where does your spirituality come in there? Uh, isn't that the drive, though? Yeah, I think it's it, it's the vein. Right. It, you know, everything is in, If I feel like, and everybody has their different, what they're connected to. Do mm-hmm. you know what I mean? So, like, for me, it's connecting with other people on an intuitive level. It's right. no matter where I am doing that. Like that to me, I don't really subscribe to a religion, but that's my purpose. Right. And so um, I think if we'd see people just living more through their spirituality mm-hmm. and not to use that. And I think that that's another word, too, that's just so overused, um, you know, not this like new agey thing, but like being true. Well, being true in your interactions with others, period. Yeah. Being, and being kind. Like yeah. because our interactions is, is is what our life is built upon. Without them, you're you're nothing. You don't even exist if you're not interacting. Yeah. Um, you also speak about getting rid of negative energy. Do you have any tricks to that? Can you walk in a room, clap your hands, and it's gone? Mm. Like it's tough to deal with. Everybody's dealing with it. Um, you know, I just had this conversation with somebody about that. The work that I do, and I'm not a big protections person. Like I know, and that that's just not me. Um, I know that I'm work. If I'm working in light, darkness cannot come into where light is. Now, have I been affected by other people in the past? Sure. And do I? Am I able to recognize that? Yes. And have I maybe been that person? Like on the flip side, of course we have in the past. So, yeah. you know, it's not. I'm not like unicorns and balloons all the time. And there is the kind of like the darker side to this work. You know, that if I'm not taking care of myself, that I can. I'm not going to say slip into depression because I don't have personal experiences with the mental health word that is depression, but um, I have to rest a lot. 
Right. And that's one of the things that I really push with like professionals that I work with is mm-hmm. where are you resting? Right. Even if it's within a day, where are you resting? And all I ever hear is like, oh, I don't have time for that. I'm like, mm, okay, well, then call me once you've hurt your back. Or, you know, right. call me once you've had a traumatizing experience, like a car accident. Or even, you know, people think of trauma as terrible things like car accidents or like plane crashes. But someone can hear a child say to them, like, you don't have time for me. And that's a trauma. Yes. And there's different levels that come into every person where they are. And it's, you know, no trauma, no two people experience this, a trauma the same way. Right. Um, that goes back to kind of like that generational poverty. You know, I've um, spoken in a lot of different places and I'll have someone go, well, pff, I went through that and, you know, I'm fine. And I'm like, are you? Right. Are, because when people say they're fine, they're not usually fine. Right. So... Um, that fucked up, insecure, uh, narcissistic, and... And exhausted or so i, don't, I, I don't never know. remember the e but yeah, yes, yeah, yes yeah exactly and so um it is about not just saying oh yeah tomorrow oh yeah whatever but saying okay i matter now but like we're not taught to do that right i matter now yeah um our mutual good friend ali martin who's been on the show does a lot of good work also yeah um and i had to ask her how do you purge what you've brought in like you can't fill up a room full of all this emotion and this past and not wallow in it and take some of it with you. So what do you do to get it? Or do you just, you can't bottle it up. I use it. You use it. I use it. Um, I lived experience is everything that I draw from all of the time. Okay. And like um, when I'm working with someone one-on-one, I always have something that I can pull from. Do you know what I mean? Like, um, I just had a whole lot of different experiences. We all have, right. but we don't recognize them as valid. So um, lived experience feeds my present and future work. Okay. And I can connect with somebody through my lived experience. Like, you mentioned me being a certified family partner. That I can connect with another adult that has a child that has a mental health disorder mm-hmm. because I've been there and I've I'm, walked that. I'm saying with the work you're doing, the other people's stuff that, that you that you swim through to mm-hmm. help them. Mm-hmm. So you just take that on also? It's not it, it's not for me to take on. Ask that question in a different way. Okay. Maybe I'm not answering it. Right, right. I um, feel like I'm not. So I said this in another show. Uh, I was studying child psychology in college until I realized the stories I would hear and what I would, the emotions I would have to, to be against to, to, to do that job well. And I was not, I could not do it. Yeah. Uh, It it would, it would crumble me on the inside and I knew that. Right. And I'm sure you take on things like that. How do you, how do you, do you just weep? Like how, you know? Well, so now that you've structured it that way, I can answer the question. Um, because I, was able to hear it. Um, ADHD has a huge part in that. It plays a huge role because I'm able to be present and then I can walk away. So just walk away. Like, I mean, yeah, and that kind of sounds callous maybe, but I'm just, it's one of the components of how I'm built. Like to be able to be a CASA that, um, my first case with my child was the same age as my son. Mm -hmm. And some of the things that were going on were just, heartbreaking but I was able to I think this is something that I've trained myself to be able to do too is I can look at something neutrally and not emotionally so Mm -hmm. I can actually look at a file and see all the components of it but not have an emotional connection to it and that happens a lot too in this work like a lot of times not just the bulls but like personal work that I do with individuals is You know, the information comes through me, and if I'm having a feeling about it, I know I'm not just channeling. I know that I'm not just letting the information come. So a lot of times I'll change my language. Like I'll say, oh, I feel, and then I say, no, wait, let me take that language off. It appears that this is what's happening. You remove the emotion. Yeah. I need to do that in my life and my emails that we've covered in. (laughs) 
other shows. <laughs> All right. Um, so let, this this brings us to what I'm very excited to talk about. You're a clairvoyant. Yes. And an empath. Yes. And what was the other Claire? You got a lot of Claires. I do have a lot of Claires going on. Um, clairvoyance. Mm -hmm. um, clairaudience. Clairaudience. That's and what it was. Um, claircognizance. Claircognizance. Which is just um, and there's another Claire I never can remember, so I might get Claircog mis mixed up with that one. But just a knowing, okay. just whatever it is, I just know that it is. All right. So yeah. That, yeah. I, al I also I didn't bring it with me, but um, I also have a book that I draw a lot of pictures in. Okay. So um, maybe next time. Right on. <laughs> so so um, I know it's part of your life, so you're like, yeah, clairvoyance. What it is that is pretty big. That's a big deal. Can you can we go into that at all? Or are you yeah. Um, so I'll say what again, like clairvoyance is for me. Mm -hmm. um, it's and it kind of happens a, a few different ways for me. Um, Sometimes it's just the information comes in. It's things that so I'm going to, I'm knocking all over the place with these things. I'm going to set them down. Um, people's information is around them all the time. And so a lot of what I do is I just pull somebody's information. It's, um, Einstein said it best that the ethers, you mm -hmm. know, that, that the things that are in the ethers all around us, it, our information is there too. And so a lot of times when I'm sitting with someone, I can pull information from their past. I can pull information from their future. I can pull information from themselves at a different age. It's just, it's almost like it's really funny because the way I see it in my head, and I see pictures a lot too. Mm -hmm. So um, what I'll see in my head, it, it almost looks like little pieces of cotton all, ar all around us. And it's like I have a little fishing wire yeah. that goes up and down and like kind of pulls that little piece of cotton and here's the information and that's yeah. sometimes when I'm sitting with someone it, it's so funny to me because I had um, actually a good friend of mine who was um, has been part of the supper club uh, she was she came to me I did a full reading for her and then she said oh wait a minute but I really wanted to know this and I was like why didn't you ask? A, why didn't you ask? But B... Because you're psychic. They want to see exactly if you can just right. guess. <laughs> and, but see, it's not about guessing. Right. It, it's about a conversation and then building and grabbing the... So what... And so I said, well, I hear what you're saying. Like, I hear that you wanted to know this thing, but we're back here. Right. So, like, you need to work on this stuff. I have so many women that... I'm not a big, like, love site. Like, that's not my thing. I really do like to more work through things with people that mm -hmm. are, um, might be the block that's keeping them from being able to be in a relationship with someone. But, um, you know, people are like, oh, well, how can I meet this guy? And I'm like, oh. <laughs> There's so much that because you don't want to meet that person where you are right now. I, I, or they be there. Yeah. Well, but that person is going to reflect what you're putting out. Right. Do you see what I'm saying? Right. So that's, um, I'm like, but this is the kind of person you've been getting, right? And they're like, yeah, and I don't like that. And I'm like, okay, well, then it's to do work for yourself that you're happy with who you are mm -hmm. so that you attract somebody that's happy with who they are. Exactly. Not somebody needing something for you to fill. And yes. they're getting the same energy from you. So it's like, hey, we're hitting it off. We need each other, but it's not the truth. You need yourself. That's huge. Um, co... What's the word I'm looking for? Um, whenever you're with somebody and like you, all you can do is try and help them and oh, like, codependency. Yes, that's huge the codependency. Word. Yeah, it's huge with substance use. Oh yeah, it is. Well, you need you need an enabler for it to even mm -hmm. happen, and then somebody to feel sorry for you, so you can have your drama. Yeah. Right. It's a play. Yeah. Life is a stage, and some people are just whining on it. You know, just love, just soaking it up. And some people don't even know that that's what they're doing. Like right. that, that's another role. thing too. Okay. Yeah. Right. It's like a lot of my work is just saying, cause I can look at it from a different point of view. Like one of the things that I, um, found out I was able to do, I can look at other people's memories from the point of view of the other person in the experience. Right. And so I'm like, but have you ever looked at it this way? And a lot of some Usually when people end up with me, they're ready to do something different. Like right. that is the one thing that I'm very glad about. And so um, they're in a place to hear that. 
Right. And usually, like, we've done some work to where they're like, oh, God, I, yeah, I do that. Like, oh, yeah. And so I'm just kind of moving pieces together and showing them back to them. Right. And then they make the discoveries. Them. I'm just the facilitator. Right. Beautiful. Yeah. And would you say it's it's an accumulation of bad habits that have, that have stacked up or is it it's a mindset? So um, a few years ago, I... I had a curriculum that was confidence building for girls. And then I was invited to do it with, um, with a substance use class. Uh, uh, I beg your pardon, a, a DWI class. And so I expanded on the confidence building and created this curriculum called Unstitching. And it's about going back to past things. So kind of circling back to that ACEs piece mm -hmm. and being able to undo that stitch because we we build trauma on trauma and right. usually something has happened within the first years of first five, six, maybe years of life that we take. And it's usually a misperception, mm -hmm. but we built, we continue to build our story on that. So, right. so it can be something as simple as misunderstanding someone saying something, but that puts you on the road to this is my thing that I'm going to carry and I'm, and nobody's going to be able to tell me any different. And you unstitch to unravel it. Yeah. So what I see um, is there's going back to seven. Mm -hmm. You know, there's usually at least five people are anywhere between like five and six, maybe seven if they're older stitches when they get to me. And so I always look at it like um, a dog food bag. Mm -hmm. You know how like if you pull the string the right way, it just goes. Doo -doo 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 -doo. Yeah. But if you don't do it the right way, you have to cut it or like you just end up ripping the bag open because right. you're annoyed. So unstitching is that. It's right. going back to that original stitch and just pulling it and then putting something new in it. Like, it's like, so you have to replace it because yeah. you're unraveling everything they've ever yeah. known. So you can't just leave them out there raw. Yeah. And you like it starts with something like something comes out, something goes in. Right. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Yeah. So what do you put in? Um. The answer that pops into my head when you say that is self-love. Yeah, beautiful, of course. Yeah. Of course, that's what everybody needs. You and love yourself, you'll love everyone else. If you don't love yourself, you won't love anything else. Yeah, yeah perfect, great. Right. We're done, that's it. No, yeah. we're not done. <laughs> <laughs> I've got so many things to talk about. <laughs> um, um, earlier I was talking about the, the, three, the, the three balls of like life, and you said, what about your spirituality? Um, the spirituality is a base that you don't juggle to me. That is a baseline to me that is mm. just is. It's it's so it's not something that could be manipulated, moved, or mm -hmm. you know, it's it's how it's it's what gives us breath, I believe. And within that, then I was talking about the juggling. But the spirituality, I mean, my spirit is very connected because I, I can I can see the impossible being done because of my spirit. I'm like, oh, we can do anything. Right. We're unstoppable, no matter what it looks like. You know, call things that aren't as if they are or whatever. I'm not sure the quote. Okay. <laughs> so speaking of the supper club you mentioned. Yes. You used to have a circle of super friends is what I call them. But they're other clairvoyant psychics, empaths, and you guys would meet monthly? Yeah. So we would meet once a month in a local restaurant. We always did um, just local, no chains, you know, to be mm -hmm. able to support. I'm huge into like supporting local. Um, and like being a part of that community. And so we would meet once a month and just have a psychic conversation, a conversation that you can't have anywhere else. Right, amongst peers. Yeah. That's beautiful. I'm super, peers is like where it's at. Right. Like I'm, anytime that I come across somebody that wants to put themselves out as an expert, I'm like, <gasps> that gives me like kind of a bad taste in my mouth. But right. um, yeah, it's in because we're always learning from each other. Right. Like someone might come to a dinner that they're like, oh, I'm not psychic. And people say that all the time. Like, so I'm like, okay, well, if you're not psychic, can you accept that you're intuitive? Like right. usually people can be more accepting of that. Right. And right. especially if anyone wants to kind of connect it with any kind of like religion, like spirit, Holy spirit, you know, universe, right. God. I mean, we're all connected to something bigger. Whatever it is. Yeah. Right. Like just period the end. And, um, so we would just meet and support each other mm -hmm. and um everybody it kind of morphed a little bit when i very first started it it was actually because people that i was having readings with 
their con- their information was connected. And so I would be like, and it, that usually happens. Like people will come to see me in, the word I'm trying to use is in a stream. So there'll be almost like a an ongoing factor about like within five or six readings, you know, that a, a, an ongoing theme. Right. And so I just started thinking, why don't these people just meet each other? That would be even better because then I'm kind of like that channeling piece. What if they could connect as peers and like do healing work together? Right. And so that's what started the Supper Club. Now, is there a, I mean, so like I'm trying to write a book and I feel very weird telling someone I'm a writer. Right. right? Oh, God, yes. So what is the stigmatism on the word psychic? Like how do you like... I mean, you know, writing's an everyday thing, but being being in the supernatural realm has got to be tough. So for those people to come together, it's got to be a blessing, to like just to be able to look across and be like, you don't think I'm crazy? Right. In fact, we can build on this reality. Right. Right. So. It, well, it's just everybody's something. Do you know what I mean? Like, find your people, and if you can mm-hmm. say. And still people won't say that they're psychic. Like, I have a hard time saying I'm psychic because to me that says I'm an expert. I'm no expert. This Mm -hmm. is just something that I'm able to do. And that I have saw that and I'm like, well, I want to do it better. And not better than anybody else, but the best that I can. To do better work. You want to do good work. You want to do better work. Yeah. So it's... um, Yeah, there is a big stigma. And it's so funny, though, because I used to keep, like, my professional life very separate from my psychic life. Mm -hmm. And I actually have a really good friend who was – I did work with the school district. And she was at the school district. And I was – we had kind of met and become instant friends through the confidence building stuff for kids. And we were driving one day, and I was wanting to tell her about the supper club, but I didn't – Wanted to think I was crazy. I mean, right. you know, and so I said, oh, we were pulling off of the tour. I'll never forget. And I said, well, you know, um, like I have this supper club for psychics. And she goes, oh, my best friend's psychic. So anyway, blah. and I was just like, oh, my oh. God. Like, right. she didn't freak out. And Well, most people have a family member or someone yeah. who's psychic. They know. So I have a cousin who can uh, see spirits like vividly, yeah. like, like, um, Two minute conversations with the guy, you're balling on the ground. Like it happens oh, yeah. a lot. Yeah. Right. So yep. he's he's trying to control it. But it's it's a reality in the world. But it's not really celebrated, I would say. It's more of like, hey, they're kinda weird over mm-hmm. there. Um, definitely fringe. Do you yeah. know what I mean? Like definitely right. outliers. But um I don't know a whole lot of people that like actually step forward as intuitives or psychics that want to be in the mainstream. Well, because they're going to ask them lottery numbers or when am I going to die? Yeah. When am I going to get married? That's my favorite. Like, and I've kind of figured out, um, I was listening to an interview with Rhonda Rossi. Uh-huh. And she said, you know, someone was talking to her about fighting. And she's like, I'm a professional. I'm not an amateur. And I was like, God, yeah, because that's the first thing people say to me is, oh, if you're psychic, like, right. what am I thinking? <laughs> yeah. And so when they're like, oh, I'm psychic, what are you thinking? I always say, oh, do you want to make an appointment? Right. Perfect. And then they're like, no, oh, no, you know, no. or, or <laughs> right, right. maybe, do you know what, I mean? it's like, yeah, yeah. It, just saying that not in a way of like, beat it, I don't want to listen to what, like, you're trying to they crack They may be on searching. Me. Exactly. Yeah. They may be searching. Like, so people, like, it's therapy. It's a healing. Yeah. Right? It, if, when anyone can be open t- to exploring it's hard, though, because fear comes in. Mm-hmm. And people are like, but aren't you afraid of X? Right. You know, aren't you afraid of... And I've come up against... Not against. I've brushed up against some things that weren't pleasant. Right. And, but it goes back to lived experience that I feel like that happened so that I could recognize it in the future. Right. And it'd be a tool in the future. Yeah. And so in that way, I'm really big about flipping, you know, like especially being autistic Mm -hmm. you know everything is and a mental health disorder it's like it's just different it's not a to me it's not a disorder in fact autism is a strength of mine it's almost like a bonus yeah if and you have to know how to use it right like there's certain things that i can't do i can't be in a loud restaurant i can't it's overwhelming to me right and um 
I can't be in a place where more than two conversations are happening. And then if somebody like flicks on a TV or radio, like I have to leave the area because it's so overwhelming. Right. But it's funny because someone asked me, more than one person said, like, do you think that you're psychic because you're autistic? And I'm like, I don't, I don't know if, I know they're connected. Right. I definitely know that. In fact, um, I did, um, I used to have a radio show and right. I did an interview with um, a neuroscientist up in Portland um, about, uh, she's trying to, she's wanting to prove that autistic children communicate telepathically, especially nonverbal, mm -hmm. with their caregivers. And we actually okay. were having a conversation regarding an autistic child that she had used it as a subject. And I began to see the autistic language. And I had never done it before, and I've never done it since. And um, But not my autistic language, because I'm verbal. Right. You know, I'm so you're high witnessing... You're witnessing like these kind of things coming by and I was just like my question is always show me more like right. show me more tell me more um, especially when I'm working with somebody and I'm feeling I'm, I'm not getting it's like the information is here but I'm kind of here I'm like open my field so mm -hmm. that I can get to what I'm looking for um, but yeah I kind of went off on a tangent That's so fine. I apologize That's bring, fine. take bring me back No no no, no we're we're good um I would l I would I wanted to get to the autism mm. um discussion Well okay so a second ago you were speaking about the restaurants and the, and the being overwhelmed and I I believe that it may be because you're so hyper hyperly sensitively in tune Yeah right that the the static background noise that doesn't have any meaning would definitely rub you wrong when when you are so in tune with the emotional and spiritual like the pure sense of it everything else will be just like crackly to you yeah it's additional information that i don't want they don't need yeah right. yeah <laughs> yeah and it's um like tone certain tones are very very disruptive for me mm -hmm. um and others very healing for you yeah like my bowls are all very deep mm -hmm. and that is like the sound of a cello or like whales it's okay. very healing for me right um the sound of so my son is 17 and he loves rap and mm -hmm. like that hi-hat sound mm -hmm. they'll he'll turn it on sometimes in the car and i'm like mm -mm, not right can't now do it. <laughs> like you're and he's like i don't understand and i'm just like i i can't do it right yeah. right so i had um some twins on the other day connor and casper shaheen really really good kids and of course i brought up esp with them oh yeah and um not even a question of course of course they're communicating they're like oh yeah i could feel it i could see it it's more of a you know it's it's totally intuitive now just a theory but you know um when a person is blind their other senses are yeah. more heightened so maybe for autism or their spirits heightened to scream out for their survival to get to get their caregivers in because like if they can't verbally communicate it but they still have the needs to survive they are you know, living, breathing spirits. Yeah. So you think... So one of the things that I'm finding about the kids that are here now is that they cannot put up with the BS. They can't. They, it, they, it repels them to the point that... And so a lot of my work, I'm going to say this, and I don't know how it'll be accepted, but I do know... Because I do know this is true, but kids with mental health issues and kids that are highly sensitive, no matter if it's mental health or intuitively, they cannot do it in a way that is, what's the word I'm looking for? Um, the only word that's like coming to my head, and I apologize, but it's like bastardized do you right. know what i'm saying like, it they cannot do that right and so and this is the experience that i've had with many kids is they would rather die than to do it that way and it they is, do it in a way that somebody's telling them to do it in a way that is in um in genuine mm -hmm. in um they just cut right to it right and so they can't do the dance and they don't it's not that they even don't want to. Like, I've had a lot of people be like, well, they're just being defiant. I'm no. like, it is painful. Yeah. Like, the bullshit is painful. Yeah. It's just, it's painful. I feel that 100%. I can't yeah. take it either. I can't beat around the bush. I need, let's just do it and move on. 
Yeah, I understand. I understand it completely. I wonder what that means. All right. Um, I'd like to say how lucky those children are to have you in their life. Somebody that has so much healing power with them. Like, they're brought to you for a reason, right? And they should, I mean, they should be very grateful. Um, I want to go back to the mental health discussion. Yeah. And I'd hate to bring it up, but we're under a rash of school shootings, mass shootings. And the, the, the mental health discussion in this country is not going very positive for mm-hmm. the people that are suffering with these conditions. Yeah. Um, the medications are coming under fire, which maybe they should, maybe they shouldn't. The antidepressants, the, the additives to the antidepressants. Most of these people are on medication when it happens mm-hmm. or off of a medication they have been on. Right. So they've yes. been conditioned in a way. Well, what, I mean, as a healer, I know you cannot fix this, but what do we do? So you just use the perfect word. Everybody wants to fix something. Mm -hmm. And this is people are not. Okay. So anytime that I hear or say anything that's true, I get a tingle from my knee down to my ankle on my left leg. And that just happened. So um, people don't need to be fixed. Right. Now, there are adjustments that can be made. To be honest, so this goes back to someone that is living in a space that is hate-filled or the other word that I kind of keep hearing is disrupt disruptive Mm -hmm. to the self to like the psyche to the spirit um like that can't stand and so right the it's like things have been the ante has been upped do you know what I mean like um you know before it was just suicide now It's school shootings. That's lashing out, then right. suicide. And then, but it's interesting to me too, is that those things can be adjusted. And the, the, you know, one of the things, especially with social media, I mean like, oh my God, you can't even get me started. But whenever people are like, someone puts up a comment and someone else immediately has to say, you're stupid. Right, just the attack. It's so terrible. But one of the things that I'm seeing is that so much is a misperception. And everybody perceives things differently. Mm -hmm. And so that is that person's perception because of their background, because of their location, because of their family, that generational piece, because Mm -hmm. it's always been done this way and you just do it that way and you don't ask any questions. And like, what's your problem if you're trying to step out of line? Right. Do you know what I mean? um, It's almost like these kids. So like kind of what I'm seeing in my head is like they're spinning away. That's the only thing that they right. can do. And it kind of goes back to the ACEs thing. If you have years and years of this training laid on top of itself, your body is going to be at disease mm-hmm. and your mental health is going to be poor. And it goes back to spinning out spinning out and and now wanting to have an even bigger effect than just me because just me doesn't matter who does nobody cares anyway so why does just me even matter right if someone were noticing something in a family member what would be a good step other than sounding alarms because stray jackets come up in people's minds Mm -hmm. you don't want to be taken away and you don't want the stigmatism come stigmatism coming down on a loved one right so maybe it's just hidden or just dealt with or put to the side and go back to life and hopefully it'll fix itself you know like what that doesn't but things i've just been talking about this recently things that are hidden do not stay hidden right so to just be like and and look at how well that's worked for us so far it hasn't right you know it light has to be shined or shown into dark corners and light is love right so um and it's understanding and it's acceptance. Um, I was just at a, um, a a family recovery training, and there was a woman there that was speaking, and I, so clearly I was like, people want, just want their loved one back, but they have to accept that the person that they get back might not be exactly who has gone. You're not going to go through something like this and be that same person again. Of course not. Right, I see what you're saying. You're just not. And so to end, I mean, I went through, it's interesting because um, I went through an experience with my son that my CASA work 
was my training for this mm. to okay. be able. And I got to a point where I was so emotionally overrun and worn out that I just got to a point where I was like, I have to look at this as if this is not my child. Okay, right. I have to look at this as a case. And that's how you had the disconnect. And yeah, and it and to look at it objectively. I I had learned somewhere else tools to apply to my own situation. Right. And that it was priceless. Right. It was priceless. And so like that's what hologram that's what the nonprofit is. Hologram is um, helping others live on. Right. You know, taking your lived experience, um, mine as a certified family partner, child with mental health, and now, um, and being so involved in like the recovery and um, like the word they use now for addiction is substance use disorder. Right. And I actually was um, speaking to a class and someone said, oh, they always want to sugarcoat it. And I said, no, that's not what it is. Because people look at addiction as, Mm, what's your problem? Why right. can't you? Why can't you just yeah, just just don't do that? Right. Like, but if you look at it as a brain chemistry disease, mm -hmm. which is what it is, right? And then people are like, but what about if you don't ever drink or you don't ever use a drug? Well, then that just stays dormant. Right. But it'll come up somewhere else. Right. Do you know what I mean? Yes. Like, yes. disorders come out somewhere else, and so going back to being able to. Judgment is huge, huge. Just going back to someone putting something online that, my God, like a kitten video, and somebody has to say something right. negative <laughs> about it. It's like, can you not just enjoy it for what it is? Right. And right. But everybody has to like put in that two cents worth. Well, um, this kind of goes back to what you were saying about I wanted my loved one back. People have their projections that they believe yeah. others should should be, and you don't fit that. They're trying to get you back in the box, yeah. but that's not you. So it comes to the acceptance. Like if you don't accept who they're, the only constant in the universe is change. Yes, people are constantly changing. If you can't accept that new person, then you are going to try to project that old way on them. And when they step out of those lines, it's always. It's a control thing. You're going to try to get them back into control, but they're no longer that person. There's no way they can be what they're not. Right. So it's going to be an unending battle. And it's also about if I have to accept that you're different, I have to accept that I have had an experience as well. Right. And a lot of people, a lot of family members can't do that. That's why peers are so important. Someone with lived experience that is not right there in the inner circle of that person. Right. Because somebody else can come in and do the work with them that a family member just can't because there is all that judgment and like what reflects on me. That's one of the things that I see a lot working with kids is their parents are saying, well, other people are going to judge me because what I did something wrong. But, so there's so many like different layers to kind of right. and then through. within the family structure everybody has their roles right. and if you suddenly don't feel like you fit but you're still going to act to preserve the family structure yeah. that could also be deadening to you and that's a generational trauma thing too right there right and then then you people in those roles don't want to see you outside that role so they can't help you right. right they see you within that role right yeah so it's like a it's a cycle that can't be like it can be broken if somebody steps out as like you said earlier and they break the cycle yeah. and then the rest of the people see that it maybe is possible to yeah. get out of that cycle yeah all right that's awesome so um one more thing the opioid e epidemic that you're helping with in this country mm -hmm. um lots of ptsd Mm -hmm. Lots of ex-soldiers, lots of traumatized people from life period. It doesn't have to be a war in Iraq. Exactly. It could be a, uh, an alcoholic parent. It can be an abusive parent, yeah. right? It could be a verbally abusive parent. They've yes. never touched you physically at all. Um, and it's also the strength of these new medications, period. It has mm -hmm. nothing to do, well, it has some to do with the experience, <laughs> but they are designed to keep you trapped are they not they they replace a, a chemical balance that makes you dependent on them highly dependent so akin deb what do we do so <laughs> going back to um and like i'm just gonna i just um earlier this week i heard i saw it or heard it two different times and i might say it wrong but osum's razor 
Do you know that saying? No. Um, it's I think it's O S S U M's razor. It's basically the I, the theory that the simplest out of a lot of different theories, the simplest one is most likely correct. Yeah, simplicity is genius. Right. Oh, some so, razor. I got you. Like the um, the idea of kiss, keep it simple. Mm -hmm. Sometimes people say stupid, but my kids, we always used to, I would call them Sam. Like I would say, don't be a mess around Sam. And so I always say, keep it simple, Sam. Right. You know, because that's neutral, right? Right. Um, but it's simplifying things. The basis of the opioid epidemic is despair. We're true. And yes. yes. when someone is desperate, just like the school shootings, they will do anything. And right. when someone is in pain, and especially chronic pain, but one of the things, especially with fentanyl, which is mm -hmm. um, a, a hundred times more addictive than heroin, um, and then you've got car fentanyl that is just like off the charts, but that is being introduced to people that don't know that it's being introduced to them in the form of other drugs now. Mm -hmm. And so we're on a, I hate to use these words, but we're on a really slippery slope and we're not anywhere near being done yet. It's and it, just, it yeah. really does take, um, peers play a huge role here. Right. Uh, um, someone that's been there, like someone that's been through the fire that can reach a hand back. Do you right. know what I mean? And right. it's, um, because nobody's going to understand somebody that is addicted to any kind of substance better than someone who has also been addicted. addicted to a substance. Right. So um, it's in, you know, like as I'm talking, we're, I see it, we do it in tiers. We go up one tier and then we pull more people up and then we pull more up. But it has to happen that way. Right. It's and it has to happen with love. It just does. Like right. one of the experiences that um, I have had is that I can connect much better with a peer than I can with a clinician because the clinician is looking at me through a different lens. A right. peer is right. looking at me as, oh, okay, this is my experience. What's yours? Mm -hmm. They're more, we're looking at me through the lens of interest right. and not fixing that a problem to be solved right. what's what's the problem how can i fix it as a physician well, your friend's just listening to deb <laughs> right? well but also like clinical is linear this happens then this happens and i'm not saying anything about clinicians i mean mm. i have known many amazing clinicians but like the peer way is all over the place do you know what i mean and it's right. sometimes while you're going all over the place the people that I work with, they expect one thing. And when I don't do that, they're like, wait a minute. Right. Their, their, their judgment is down. Right. Their defenses are down. And it's much easier to get someone to come along with you if it's interesting. Right. And not someone telling you what to do. Um, that's why, like, when I work with an individual or a class, I'm like, let's do this together. Well, what you just said is... Someone doing this with you or someone telling you what to do when somebody does it with you. I mean, it's like it's a no brainer. Yeah. And it's also, have you tried this? Because this worked for me or right. maybe try this, not you're doing it wrong. Right. Right. Or do set A, B and C and then give me a call. Yeah. Yeah. Because that works out great. Never. No. All right. <laughs> <laughs> so to wrap this up, we have a I have a passion we share skateboards yes. skateboarding yes. Uh, i've been on a board since i was five years old i still ride sometimes all my kids ride um so awesome so awesome uh used to steal wood to build ramps before school right yes. uh um i've seen all the new Not stealing stealing is wrong right that was a long time ago <laughs> in the galaxy far far away um yeah, you were instrumental in helping a lot of these skate parks locally get started and, and brought to fruition. Yeah. Um, locally in Austin. Austin. Austin, Texas, y'all. Um, yeah, so, and this was just, I didn't look to go and become part of the skateboarding community. Although I grew up with skateboarders. Like, mm -hmm. I, um, you know, because when I was coming up, um, girls didn't skate, you know. And so the only other thing for girls to do was sit at the top of a ramp. And I hung out. It was funny. I was just having this conversation with my son. I hung out with skaters, but I also hung out with their girlfriends. 
And I kind of feel like that's part of my training too, that neutral eye of like being able to see it from both sides, Mm -hmm. you know, like being at the ramp. And of course this was before cell phones, but, um, and one guy being like, Oh, I got to go see my girlfriend. And then being on a different day with her and her being like, why isn't he here yet? And do you know what I mean? Like seeing that and being like, dude, why don't you just skate? That's what you want to do. Why don't you just skate? And I mean, like there's so many reasons why they didn't, but do what makes you happy. Like, you right. know what I mean? And Or be with somebody that wants you to do what makes you happy. So that's like the value of being on the fringe, to be able to look in and see all things. Yeah. Because you're far enough away that you're not wrapped up in it. Yeah. It's kind of lonely sometimes, too, though. I'm sure. That is one thing with like this work is um, people come to me when they need help. And then mm-hmm. they get the help they need, and, and then they move on, which yeah. is what I want. Is what you what you're doing for them? Yeah. You're helping them, you're fixing them, but then there they go. Don't say I'm fixing them. Okay, I'm, not all fixing right. them. We're, we're, uh, I'm helping them. Right, um, awesome. Help themselves, cool. but right, yeah. um, but so skateboarding. Mm-hmm. I my son started skateboarding when he was like five or six years old, mm-hmm. and was like skating bowls by the time. I mean, like at seven. I mean, he was doing, it was amazing. And so um, I ended up working for the local skate shop just so that I could get paid in product. Oh, sick. And then... He was riding bowls at seven? Mm -hmm. Mm-hmm. Where did you find... He was dropping in at seven and, like, doing crazy technically, like, super skilled street tricks that, like, the older guys were like, I can't even do that. Right. But that's how I got involved in skateboarding. And then all the skaters would come and hang out at the shop. Mm-hmm. And then of we, course, that's the hub. Yeah, yeah, that's where you go. And then um, they ended up, we got some funding in um, Leander. So I worked with the parks department to get that done. And mm-hmm. um, I actually ended up joining the parks board. And I was on it for like six years after that. So it kind of led me in another direction. But And then we got some funding in Cedar Park and me and a couple of the older guys, because the kids don't want to show up to to city council meetings. um, They, um, we worked with the designer who was New Line and they were going to put a plaza in Cedar Park. But because I was connected with the local community, they ended up making it more of like a really big, I hate to say this because I'm not going to say it right, but more of like a flow bowl so that it was all up, uh, like a big, huge bowl that you right. can skate little spots. Right. So, yeah, that was that. I'm really proud of that work. Yeah, that is awesome. I'm really proud of all the work you've done. It's been so nice for you being on the show.